In this lesson, we're going to go over the most frequently tested and highest yielding areas of agency on the bar exam in 60 minutes or less. Or in other words, we're going to go over the absolute must know stuff in agency for the bar exam, which historically, if we look at the data, is going to be the power of the agent to bind the principal, right? This is an analysis we really want to understand going into the bar exam. So this is where I'm gonna spend the majority of our time in this lesson, really breaking down as best as I possibly can over the next 60 minutes or so. But with that, I can just set our timer to one hour. Ready, set, go. So the clock has officially started. We can jump right into agency. So of course, we know that agency is a part of business associations, right? In business associations, we really have three major categories, right? We have agency, we have agency and partnership, and we have corporations and LLCs kind of in a separate universe, right? Oftentimes we see two subcategories of agency and partnership, and on the other side, we see corporations and LLCs. I think it's even important to separate agency and partnership into additional subcategories where we really separate agency from partnership. And I think that'll become clear as we work through this video why we're doing that. But just from the top, I can tell you one thing that makes agency unique as a subject is that agency can kind of pop up, or at least issues of agency can pop up in a lot of different types of analyses, right? Whether you're doing a contract law fact pattern, a torts fact pattern, a partnership fact pattern, some other type of business associations fact pattern, right? There's a lot of places elements of agency can kind of show up, right? So for that reason, we really want to be comfortable with the agency analysis itself, right? Because it can pop up in a lot of places. And we'll see, as we're going to go through an essay here at the end of this video, that agency itself can be tested entirely as a whole essay, right? Just agency, right? Nothing about partnerships or corporations and LLCs. Just the agency relationship itself can be an entire essay, right? So I think it's important for all of those reasons to really focus on agency as its own subject because sometimes it is tested as its own subject. So that's what we're going to focus on just organizationally in this lesson. Now, one thing about agency, if we look at business associations as a kind of a big picture for a second, right? Agency is a part of business associations. One of the common threads we'll see in our analyses as we work through agency, when we get to partnerships and we get to corporations and LLCs, one common thread that kind of goes through all of the analyses is this idea of who is liable to who, right? In other subjects, if you're thinking about contract law, torts, criminal law, a lot of the time the question is whether or not a person is liable, right? Is this person liable for breach of contract? Is this person liable for negligence? Is this person liable for the crime of murder, right? And you work through the analyses to determine whether or not someone is liable. What makes agency unique is, right, and this flows through to other business association fact patterns, is a lot of times the bar examiners will actually tell you that a person is liable. And it's not a question as to liability itself, it's a question as, okay, but who is liable? Right, you're going to have an actor who does something usually wrongful, right? Whether it's a breach of contract or they're negligent and it results in injury, right? You're going to have some type of wrongful conduct though, usually, not always, but usually you're going to have an actor engaged in some type of wrongful conduct. And the question is going to be based on that actor's relationship to other parties in the fact pattern, who is liable for the wrongful conduct to who, right? And we'll see, imagine in a partnership where you have a lot of different partners or in corporations, LLCs, we have a lot of members involved, right? Are the partners liable to each other? Is the partnership, the business entity itself liable? What happens when we're dealing with corporations, LLCs, right? Limited liability partnerships, you know, general partnerships, where, so we'll see, right, the structure of the business that we're dealing with really affects that analysis, right? And so it'll be important to be able to distinguish between different types of 
business associations to correctly get through this analysis. So you know, who's liable? Are the members liable? Are they personally liable? Are they not personally liable? Is the business itself liable? You know, if one partner is liable and the other is not, can the partners recover from each other? Right? A lot of questions we'll kind of have to explore as we work through this. But at its core, right, kind of our starting point is actually not really a business association. It's a relationship, right, itself, right, the agency relationship. And this is kind of a whole area of law, right, we call agency law. And this is kind of the foundation of all of it. We need to understand these principles first, and then we can move on to different how this flows this type of analysis flows through other business structures, right? When we get to partnerships and eventually when we get to corporations and LLCs, right? Because we'll see certain themes here kind of reemerge even in other areas, right? So big picture though, typically a very common fact pattern or issue we're going to see is who is liable to who, right? You're going to be told, look, there is a breach of contract or there is a tort cause of action. You know, and the real question isn't whether someone's liable that's given to you, it's who is liable to who, right? So in agency, right, what are we dealing with, right? Well, agency, you can kind of separate between agency in the context of contract law and agency in the context of tort law, right? Now, typically, if you're seeing agency tested in the context of tort law, that's almost exclusively the doctrine of respondeat superior, right? And that's in usually in the employer-employee context, right? Where you have an employer who hires an employee that employee negligently causes an accident that results in injury to a third party, and the third party wants to sue for negligence. The question is who is liable, right? Is the employee liable or is the employer vicariously liable, right? And obviously both can be liable. Basically, who can that third party sue for their injury, right? And really the question is, can the third party sue the company that hired the employee, right? And that's the doctrine of respondeat superior. And it's actually a pretty straightforward doctrine. The main idea there is what's the extent of control the employer was exercising over the employee, right? The more control the employer was exercising over the employee, right? The more likely it is that the employer is vicariously liable for the employee's unintentional torts, things like negligence, right? So you classically see this in a car accident type case. Imagine a company hires a truck driver to deliver goods for them, right? That truck driver goes out while they're delivering goods and gets into a car accident with another person, right? The question is, can that person who was injured sue the company that hired the truck driver, right? That's the doctrine of respondeat superior, and it's really going to come down to whether that truck driver was an employee in a principal agent relationship, or whether that truck driver was an independent contractor. And again, that distinction is made usually around the amount of control the employee is exercising over the employee. So if the employer is exercising a ton of control over that truck driver's actions, right? When they can drive, when they can't drive, where they're driving to, right? All of those types of factors, and below the video, we'll put all of the relevant factors you could look out for. But the main idea with respondeat superior in the tort context is the more control that's exercised over the employee, the more likely it is that the employer can be held vicariously liable for the employee's unintentional torts, things like negligence, right? So respondeat superior, I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail in this video, I just wanted to touch on it because it's really more of a tort law issue and here I wanna focus on agency. And when we see agency tested as a subject, right, it's more so in the context of contract law. So that's what we're gonna focus on here, but it is important to know respondeat superior, right? That's a doctrine that is commonly tested on the bar exam. We wanna be familiar with that. We'll put a lot more information below the video for respondeat superior. And with that though, we can just jump into agency in the context of contracts, right? Because I think this is the area too where students are going to have more difficulty 
and that's obviously what I want to focus on. Where respondeat superior is a little bit more straightforward for students, sometimes agency in the context of contract law can be a little bit trickier. So it's what we want to focus on in more detail here, right? So typically the way that this plays out on an agency fact pattern, right? An agency, by the way, just to give kind of a broad strokes definition here, if someone's wondering, right? When we're talking about agency, agency is a type of relationship, right? Agency is a relationship between an agent and a party called a principal, right? Where we say the agent is acting on behalf of the principal and is subject to the principal's control. Right, so classically, this would be like a real estate agent, right? If you've ever bought a house or wanted to sell a house, right? Oftentimes, people who want to buy or sell houses don't have a lot of experience in buying and selling houses and it's a big purchase. So what do you do? You go out and you retain an agent to act on your behalf, but is subject to your control, right? So you might be like, hey, agent, I need you to sell my house for me. I don't know how to sell a house. I've never sold a house before, right? I need to get $500,000 for my house, you know, go, right? So you hire the agent to sell your house for a minimum of $500,000, right? So that would be a classic kind of principal agent fact pattern, right? You've stipulated some control, right? The agent can't just go and sell your house for a bag of peanuts, right? The agent is acting on your behalf and is subject to your control. Right, that's kind of the idea of agency, right? Principal agent relationship. It's a type of legal relationship. So that's what I'm really referring to when I use the word agency, right? And the way we most commonly see this tested on the bar exam in the context of contract law kind of goes like this, right? We're going to have a principal retain an agent. Right, that agent is then going to enter into a contract with a third party. And then of course, ultimately, the contract is breached. Right? We have a breach of contract. And the question is, who is liable to the third party for the breach of contract? Right? Is the agent liable to the third party for the breach of contract? Is the principal liable to the third party for the breach of contract? Or are both parties liable to the third party for the breach of contract? Right? And that's what we want to explore here, right? So our starting point rule is going to be that the principal is liable to the third party if the agent acts with authority. And we'll see there's two types of authority. We have actual authority, which includes this idea of ratification and apparent authority, right? So if the agent is acting with actual authority or apparent authority, then the principal is liable to the third party for the breach of contract, right? So if I want to buy a hundred dry erase markers, right? So I go and retain an agent right, to go purchase 100 dry erase markers on my behalf. And I tell that agent, hey, go buy me 100 dry erase markers for no more than a total price of $100, right, $1 per dry erase marker, right? If I say this to my agent and my agent goes out and purchases 100 dry erase markers for $99, Right, well, that agent, I granted actual express authority, right, to act on my behalf. I retained an agent and I told that agent, hey, go buy me 100 dry erase markers for no more than $100, right? And that agent goes out, buys me 100 dry erase markers for $99, right? They did exactly what I told them to do. In that case, right, that's actual express authority me, the principal, would be liable, right? So say that those dry erase markers get delivered to me, but I refuse to pay, right? The question is, who is liable for that breach of contract? And if we're trying to determine whether me, the principal, is liable, well, we'd say, of course I'm liable because the third, the agent was acting with actual authority. The agent did exactly what I told him to do, right? So I'm liable to the third party if there's a breach. If the goods are delivered, if the 100 dry erase markers get delivered and I refuse to pay, well, I'm liable for breach of contract to the third party, right? That's actual authority, right? And the way that the bar examiners define actual authority, right? The bar examiners cite the second and third restatement of agency in most of the examples, explanations that they give us. 
So it is important, I think, to read the exact language, right? So this comes from the third restatement of agency. An agent acts with actual authority when, a time, when at the time of taking action that has legal consequences for the principal, the agent reasonably believes in accordance with the principal's manifestations to the agent that the principal wishes the agent so to act. So the most obvious example of this is what I just gave, right? That would be actual express authority. Principal tells the agent to go do a certain task, right? And the agent does that task exactly as he was told to do it, right? That's actual express authority. Now, an interesting nuance to this is actual implied authority. So if I tell an agent to go buy me 100 dry erase markers for no more than $100, and I don't say anything else to the agent. I just say, go buy me 100 dry erase markers for no more than $100, right? And say the agent has a list of leads, right? The agent knows manufacturers and dry erase marker salesmen, right? He knows who to call to get the best deal. So say that agent goes out and starts calling these different dry erase marker wholesalers or manufacturers, salesmen, whoever he's calling, right? And he's negotiating deals to try to give me the best price for the 100 dry erase markers, right? When he's going out and doing that, I never told my agent to go do that, right? I never expressly told the agent, hey, go out there and negotiate, use your leads, negotiate and call these people on my behalf and, you know, negotiate on my behalf. You know, I never said any of that. I just told the agent, hey, go buy 100 dry erase markers for me for no more than $100, right? But So that was my actual express authority. But with that, right, based on my words and conduct, it could be reasonably interpreted that with that, I also implied other things. I implied to the agent, hey, if you have some context that you know you're selling dry erase markers at a good deal, go ahead, call them and negotiate with them. Even though I didn't explicitly state that, we could infer it from my conduct, right? That's actual implied authority, right? And that's what that definition is really focusing on when we look at the third restatement where it's talking about, hey, look, based on the words and conduct and the reasonable interpretation of those words and conduct, right? what it's saying is, hey, look, even if it wasn't expressly stated, if it can be reasonably interpreted from the words and conduct, right, that they had the authority, the agent had the authority to take these actions, right, that's implied actual authority, right? And it's still actual authority. Next, we get to the idea of ratification. Right, ratification would be where the principal, after the fact, ratifies the agent's actions, right? So the agent acts without authority, but then the principal, based on his conduct, ratifies the, actu the agent's actions, right? Some tongue twisters there. So what would this look like? So say that I tell my agent, right, to go buy me a hundred dry erase markers for no more than a hundred dollars. Agent goes out and buys a hundred dry erase markers for two hundred dollars, right? Not what I told him to do. That's outside the scope of the actual authority I gave that agent. So the agent comes back to me with the dry erase markers and says, hey, I couldn't get you a deal for a hundred dollars, but I still got a great deal for two hundred dollars and hands me the dry erase markers. And I say, well, I'm not paying that. I said that max, the max here that I was willing to pay, the maximum authority I granted to you was $100. So this contract you entered into for $200, you know, I never agreed to that. So I'm not going to pay. But say, at the same time, I take the dry erase markers. But I'm like, hey, look, though, I do need these dry erase markers really bad. So I'm just going to take these and say I start to use them, right? But I never pay for them. Well, when I take the dry erase markers, right, and start using them, I reap the benefits of the contract, right, and refuse to pay for them, we say that my conduct ratifies my agent's actions. Even though at the time of the transaction, my agent didn't have actual authority to 
enter into the contract for that price, for the $200 price. His authority was limited to the $100 or less price, right? Because after the fact, my conduct ratifies me reaping the benefit of the contract, right? I still hold on to the goods the agent went out and got me. My conduct ratifies the agent's actions. And we say at that point, it's as if the agent acted with actual authority, right? That ratification constitutes actual authority. Just one nuance we want to look out for there. Next, we have apparent authority. Remember, the principal is liable to the third party for breach of contract if the agent acts with actual authority or apparent authority. Right? Apparent authority, we can start with the definition from the second restatement, which the bar examiners give us, second restatement of agency apparent authority is created with respect to a third person when by written or spoken words or any other conduct the principal causes the third person to believe that the principal consents to have the act done on his behalf by the purpose by the person purporting to act for him Another mouthful, but what that really means, right? When we think about parent authority, the key to understanding this is that the principal, the principal himself, has to hold out to the third party in some way, by words or conduct, right? Some way, the principal has to hold out to the third party that the agent has the authority to act on his behalf. Right? The principal has to do something by spoken words, by conduct, one way or another. Right, The principal has to tell the third party or hold out or demonstrate to the third party that the agent does have the authority to act on the principal's behalf. Right, So in my dry erase marker example, if I call up the... Uh, the salesman, the dry marker eraser, or the dry marker sales guy. And I'm like, hey, look, I gave this agent you're about to talk to the authority to buy 100 dry erase markers on my behalf. I'm going to put them on the phone, right? And then I hand the phone over to the agent, right? And the agent starts negotiating a deal and enters into a deal on my behalf. The agent was acting with apparent authority, right? If, say, I tell my agent, hey, look, buy 100 dry erase markers for no more than $100, right? And then the agent, then I call the sales guy on the phone. I say, hey, look, I'm about to put my agent on the phone. He has the authority to enter into a contract for the purchase of 100 dry erase markers on my behalf, right? Okay, agent gets on the phone, closes the deal with the sales guy for 100 dry erase markers for $200. Well, we know the, the my agent didn't have the authority to enter into a contract for 100 dry erase markers for $200, he was limited to $100. So the agent didn't have actual authority to enter into that contract, but he did have apparent authority because I got on the phone and told the third party, hey, look, this guy you're about to talk to has my authority to enter into the contract for the purchase of 100 dry erase markers. So there was apparent authority, but because he exceeded the actual authority, right? There is no actual authority. In that case, the actual authority was limited to $100. So my agent exceeds the actual express authority, right? But it is still apparent authority, right? Because I, the principal, held out to the third party that the agent had the authority to act on my behalf. Critical to recognize that if me, the principal, never had any contact whatsoever with the third party, with the dry erase marker sales guy, right? then there could not be apparent authority, right? If the agent calls up the third party and says, hey, look, my principal is this guy at Studicata, right? I'm acting on his behalf for him. Don't worry, you don't need to talk to him. He gave me authority to act on his behalf, right? And then he enters into the contract with the dry erase marker sales guy, right? In that case, the agent didn't have apparent authority. Right? Just because the agent holds himself out as having authority, that doesn't do anything. Right? The agent holding himself out as having authority in terms of our apparent authority analysis doesn't mean anything. That's irrelevant. Right? It's whether the principal held himself out, held the agent out to the third party as having authority. Right? So if there's no words, no conduct from the principal to the third party, then apparent authority cannot exist. This is a really important point to understand. It's commonly tested because a lot of times 
the agent is going to tell the third party, oh, don't worry, you know, I have authority to act on this person's behalf, right? And it kind of looks like, it sounds like a parent authority, but it's not because remember, it's the principal that has to hold out that the agent has the authority to act on his behalf, right? So without the principal having some sort of words or conduct with the third party, a parent authority cannot exist, right? So that's how you determine the liability of the principal in this type of fact pattern. Next, we have how do you determine whether the agent is liable? So one thing that's worth noting, right? If you go through this fact pattern on the bar exam, right? Principal retains the agent, agent enters into a contract with the third party, then we have a breach of contract, right? And the question is who is liable? If you go through and you find, and there's no other parties, right? It's just principal, agent, and third party. There's no other parties involved. There's no other businesses, no, no other parties involved in the process, right? It's purely just, we have a principal, an agent, and a third party, right? Well, if we find that the principal is not liable, that there is a breach of contract and the principal is not liable, right? Then that means the agent has to be liable, right? Someone's got to be liable for the breach of contract. We can't have a breach of contract and no one's liable, right? Someone has to be liable for the breach of contract, right? So if you go through, right? And again, that's saying that those are your only two parties or you have a principal, an agent and a third party, Right? And you go through the analysis and you're like, hey, look, the principal can't be liable here because the agent wasn't acting with actual or apparent authority. Then that means pretty much de facto that the agent has to be liable. You wouldn't want to come to the conclusion that there is a breach of contract and neither the principal or nor the agent is liable, right? That is nonsensical. Somebody has to be liable, right? So both can be liable. One or the other can be liable, but you can't have neither are liable if there is a breach of contract and those are the only parties involved, right? So just one thing to keep in mind, right? So <laughs> that we're making logical arguments on our essays, right? So how do you determine though whether the agent is liable to the third party? Right, well, your starting point is obviously if the agent holds himself out as having authority and acts without authority, then the agent is clearly liable, right? We call that a breach of an implied warranty. Right? If the agent calls up the principal and says, hey, look, I'm acting on behalf of this person, right? He's given me the authority to do this deal on his behalf, right? And the agent holds out that authority, but acts without any authority. The agent doesn't have actual or apparent authority to act. We say that's a breach of the implied warranty and the agent is going to be liable to the third party for that breach of contract. Next, if the agent simply fails to disclose existence of the principal to the third party, right, then the agent is liable to the third party, right? Say the agent just shows up and signs the contract in his own name, never makes any mention of a principal being involved, then the third party doesn't even know that there is a principal out there, right? So of course the agent is going to be liable in that point. The print or the third party thinks the contract is just between the agent and the third party, right? He doesn't even know that a principal exists. In that case, the agent is obviously going to be liable. Right, and then finally, we have this unique situation where we have partial disclosure, where the agent fails to disclose the identity of the principal to the third party, right? But still says that there is this principal out there. So that would be like, hey, I'm acting on behalf of this guy that's out there, but I can't tell you who he is, right? Then we'll say in that case, it comes down to whether the agent is acting with authority or without authority, right? And if the agent makes this type of partial disclosure, hey, a principal is out there, but I'm not gonna tell you his identity. If the agent's acting with actual or apparent authority, then the agent is held liable unless the agent and third party agree otherwise, right? If the agent and third party enter into a contract where they say, hey, look, there is this other third, there is this principal out there, and if there's a breach, he is solely liable, then okay, right? Then in that case, if the agent and third party agree otherwise, 
then the principal would be liable. But unless the agent and third party agree otherwise, right, if the agent fails to disclose the identity of the principal to the third party, but does disclose the existence of the principal to the third party, and the agent acts with actual or apparent authority, we say the agent is liable to the third party for the breach of contract. Right, so I'm sure all of this sounds a little bit confusing. The best way to flesh it out is working through an actual essay. Right, I think it's really important anytime we're going over subjects that could only be tested on the essay portion, I think it's important to take a look at some actual essays. So I have up here on the board an actual essay that I think will illustrate this analysis really well. I've chosen an essay that tests a lot of different nuances and aspects of the agency relationship in the contract context. This is a very classic kind of fact pattern and analysis. This will really demonstrate all the different nuances. So I think this is a great example for us to work through. And it also shows that agency as itself, right? Just the agency relationship outside of any other business association can be its own subject, right? So we really want to understand this analysis, be comfortable with it going into the bar exam. Okay, so first thing you do, right? you sit down, you're looking at the essay, what do you do, right? First thing we always, always, always do when we're approaching essays is jump to the bottom, right? We wanna read the call of the question. The call of the question is gonna give us the roadmap, the clues, what we should look out for as we read the rest of the fact pattern. So I would immediately jump down to the bottom, right? And I wanna read this. What is the call of the question of this essay telling me, right? So here, if I jump to the very bottom, it tells us thank you so much for watching this video preview of our bar blitz video series if you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire bar blitz video library which includes coverage of the most frequently tested and highest yielding areas of law in each bar exam subject we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled in studicata bar review you to get started with your no risk free trial today simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com